Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse uh, number 1. It says, The serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made. For he spoke to the woman, Do I understand that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, Not at all. Uh, we can eat from the trees in the garden. It's only about the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, Don't eat from it. For, don't even touch it uh, or you'll die. Verse 4, The serpent told the woman, you won't die, for God knows that that moment you eat from that tree, you'll see what's really going on and you'll be just like God, knowing everything, ranging all the way from good to evil. For when the woman saw that the tree looked like good eating and realized what she would get out of it, that she would know everything, she took and ate the fruit and then gave some to her husband and he also ate. Immediately the two of them did see what's really going on, for they saw themselves naked. So they sewed fig leaves together as makeshift cloths for themselves. And when they heard the sound, verse 8, when they heard the sound of God strolling in the garden uh, in the evening breeze, the man and his wife, they hid in the trees of the garden, hiding from God. God called to the man, where are you? I believe it's the same question I want to dive in today with you. The same question God is asking you, I believe is the same question God was asking Adam. Where are you? Where are you? Verse 10, he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. God said this, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from that tree that I told you not to eat from? And then the man said, uh, what every husband's afraid to say, the woman you gave me. <laughs> Notice he didn't just say the woman. He puts it back at God's feet. The woman you gave me as a companion, she gave me the fruit from the tree. And so, yes, of course I did what my wife told me to do. I ate it. God said to the woman what no man will say to his wife. What is this? that you have done the serpent seduced me she said and i ate i want to draw your attention to verse 11 who told you you were naked did you eat from that tree that i told you not to eat from let's pray lord thank you for your word thank you for god this moment that we have in church god i pray for these next 25 minutes lord as we can dive into your word god that you would just uh speak to us make this word clear make your bible come to life god i pray for salvation to come i pray for life change to take place lord i praise you in advance i thank you in advance for the things that you'll do in this room god we love you today we honor you today and we give you praise and it's in Jesus' name that I pray, and everybody says amen, amen. If you're taking notes, uh, you can write the message title down, Naked and Afraid. Naked and Afraid. You know, there is a difference between naked and nudity. Uh, naked uh, is when you, uh, you know, naked is when you are uncovered or you are vulnerable uh, nudity is, if you look at the definition, just meaning uh, you, are, you are without clothes. Let me explain with that. So if you're home on a Friday night at 930 and you ain't got nobody there uh, making a, some toast, <laughs> you might be nude. But when the doorbell rings and it's your in-laws, now you become naked. <laughs> just let that settle for just a second. <laughs> that went really well. <laughs> Naked and afraid. You know, today we're living in a culture where, uh, you know, depending on what channel you watch, what, what newspaper you, you watch, what coverage you watch, uh, there, are, there are problem after problem after problem. There are what seems to be issue after issue after issue. And it's like, uh, have you, you ever, you ever, you ever, uh, Try, try to blow up balloons for a birthday party and you put so much air into a balloon that eventually like you know one more breath's gonna pop that balloon. Like that's almost what I feel like is happening in our world today. That we've, we, we, we've, we've put so much pressure on society, so much, so much pressure on culture that it seems like it's ready to pop at any given moment. And if you're not careful, 
you'll take the stance and what they want you to, we, what they want us to take the stance on is we have a government problem. We have a, our, our problem's not the government. Uh, our problem's not, not, not the president. Our problem's not the Senate. Like we don't have a governmental problem, which we could debate on that. But the problem that we have today is a sin problem. Like we don't have a racial problem in today. The there is racism, but racism is birthed out of a sin problem. And we have a sin issue and we have a problem that, that everybody here, uh, we all are under the same place today, uh, really um, uh, prescribed with the same disease, so to speak, a sin issue, a sin problem, but we all have access to the solution today, which is Jesus Christ and his shed blood, somebody, come on. And so no matter what the problem of sin is, there's an answer found in God, found in Jesus Christ, the son and found in his holy word. And so today, this is not a fake news sermon. This is not an old news sermon. This is a real news, good news gospel message about a man named Jesus who knew no sin, but became sin, not only took sin, went to the grave, conquered death, hell in the grave, so that people today in 2021 could confess their sin and forever live in eternity with Jesus Christ. This is a good, this is a good message today. If you're looking for a bad news message, you're going to be very upset at the end of this because I ain't got no bad news today. Just good news. And so you got to be careful what you listen to because what you listen to will dictate where you walk. Like there was an old saying, an old adage when I grew up, my mom and dad and my teachers in school would say, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Uh, is there anything more, more, more wrong and off base than that statement? Like I've had a lot of words hurt me more than a broken arm has hurt me. And so like there, 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 there is a, a, a uh, there are words, right? Like you have, the words have the potential to shape you. They have the potential to change you. They have the potential to elevate you, to push you, to draw you, or words have the potential to rip you apart. Like have you, you ever, you ever tried to get something, you know, you, you let something go and you wish you could get it back. Like once you speak it, like you can chase it forever, but you ain't never getting it back. That's why I love typing in my phone, because I can type words that I can always hit the backspace on. <laughs> but words, they're powerful. Words, man, words have the potential to, to, to build confidence in your children, or they can completely destroy your children. Wives, you can either edify your husband and build your husband, or you can, your words can destroy your husband. Husbands, your words can build up your wife and encourage your wife, or they can destroy your wife. There are, there are, there are power, there is power in words. And in a culture today, words are just thrown around, right? They're, we just throw words around like, they just, just throw them around like biscuits at, at Cracker Barrel. Like we just throw them out there. But words are dangerous and words carry weight and words have the potential to wound. Like, like there, there are so much power in the words. I say we let Jesus' words build us. I say you let Jesus' word shape you. I say you let the Bible tell you who you are. I say you let God's word fill you. I say you let God's word uh, build up your faith. I say you put the God's word and develop trust. I say you let God's word be foundation. If you're going to let any type of word shape you, why don't you let God's word shape you? Have you ever done something stupid before? How many people, let's just, let's just, let's just see a show of hands. How many people have never done something stupid before in your life? 100% class participation. Every one of us have done something stupid in our life. Uh, how many people before you got to church today at uh, 1030 have done something stupid? There we go. Yeah, beautiful, isn't it? The fact is we all, the Bible says, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there's a sin problem in the world, but there's also a solution called the grace of God and the blood of Jesus. And so, I, you know, why is it, I, I, what I've noticed, I've raised three kids, helped raise three kids, and now I'm looking at my children and how they act, I know what a blessing I was to my mom and dad as they were raising me. <laughs> but maybe, maybe you can relate today. Why is it that when your mom and dad says, don't do this, the moment they're gone, we doing it. Like it's, it's almost ingrained in our nature. Like, hey, don't do this, Zion. Okay, dad, I leave the room for 30 seconds and he's hanging from the ceiling fan in the living room. Why? Because it's in our DNA like to do the thing we're not supposed to do. 
And what I found out about my parents now raising kids, they, they, they didn't say for me not to do it because they didn't want me to have fun. They told me, hey, don't do this because I'm trying to protect you because I know the consequence or the result of what you're about ready to get into. And if you're not careful, we'll treat the Bible the same way that all of a sudden we'll view the Bible as some, some rule book where it takes the, the fun out of our whole entire life. That's not God's version of his, of his life he wants for us. Like God didn't write this manual called the Bible so that Christian people following after him, taking up our cross daily, being miserable? No, that's not God's plan. Like God's plan, that is, that is not a rule book. It's a road map. Like, it, this is a book cover to cover of a love story all about how Christian people are to live like Christian people. It's not, it's not a book saying, don't, don't smile, don't come to church and be happy, don't, don't run in church, don't clap in church. This thing is a roadmap designed for you and I to read it and not just uh, not understand it, but actually read Bible stories like David and Goliath and gain a revelation that, wait a minute, what giants do I have in my life if I just pick up a stone of faith and hurl it at the giant? And all of a sudden, these words, these Bible stories that we read as a child, all of a sudden come to life in our spirit. But if you're not careful, you, you'll think that, man, once you're a Christian, it ain't no fun. I refuse to ha let the world have more fun than church people do. Like, I refuse to get more excited. I was in bed last night at 8.45. I didn't even watch the Gonzaga game. Why? Because I knew I was going to have way more fun in this room than I was in my living room. And I refuse to yell louder about a round ball than I do about Jesus Christ. I say we have fun in church. Since sin went, when did we buy into the fact that once you serve Jesus and become a Christian, you become irrelevant? Why are, when, did, when did Christian people become irrelevant? Like, we're not dorky people. Most of us. Right? Like, we're not, we're not weird people. Most of us. There are some weird people, you know, but, you know, but we're not irrelevant. Like, we've got the power of Jesus in us. Like, we're heaven-bound. We're grace-filled. Like, all of a sudden, because we serve Jesus, we can no longer have fun. No, Jesus doesn't take the fun away from us. Jesus brings the fun to the party. And so be careful what you listen to. I just refuse. Like, as a pastor, I refuse. I refuse not to show up and have a good time in church. Like, you know, like this, I refused to walk by Belk yesterday and find this for $42 and not buy it and wear it to church. I said, give me that sucker. I'm wearing it tomorrow. Yes, I did. <laughs> look down to your right. Look down to your left. Everybody, you just laid eyes on. Look up here at this man in a pink jacket. Every single one of us are in the same position today. You, you, didn't lay, you didn't lay eyes on one person in this room that hasn't sinned or did something that they're not ashamed of. We're all jacked up. We're all imperfect. We're, we're all got issues. We're all a work in progress. I, I tell myself that I'm saved and I'm in need of saving. In other words, I'm, I'm, try I'm, I'm trying to be sanctified. There's a thing called sanctification in the Bible, and it doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. You keep showing up. You keep coming to church. You keep reading his word. And the danger is you think that you're on the outside because you got sin, but that's the beauty of the gospel. That's the message of hope that we have today. That like Jesus came out of the grave, you can come out of the grave too, spiritually speaking. And you know, the enemy, he, 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 loves, to, uh, he loves to attack people in their minds. You, you, ever, you, you, ever, you ever just felt like, like you got this weak moment, you know, there's a thorn in your flesh like the Apostle Paul talked about. Like, yeah, you got this one thing that the enemy always comes and attacks you on. Like, he's real good at getting you to, you know, and, 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 you, and you know it's him because he always speaks in half-truths. But you know what a half-truth is? It's a lie. Like, if it's half-truth, it must be half of a lie. And so it's good to know that, man, when the devil's speaking, write this down. If the devil's speaking, the devil's lying. The only thing he wants from you, it is not to better your life. The enemy, Satan, all he wants for you is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. If he's speaking, he's lying. The Bible says he's the father of lies. That means he couldn't tell the truth if he had to. 
And he'll do these things. He'll get you to compromise, little compromises. You you're finally get saved. You're in church and you're following after Jesus. You're committed to come back, to come back Sunday next week. Going to have an after party. It's going to be amazing. And all of a sudden, on Monday, he gets you to go back to that thing that God set you free from. And so maybe you go to that wrong website. Just one time, ain't nobody going to see. Just, just, just try it. And all of a sudden, well, maybe you just, you know, just do it again on Tuesday. And, all, and then just talk to this person on Wednesday. And, and all of a sudden, just little compromises. Because after all, the devil said, ain't nobody going to find out about it. Just between me and you. And it, it'll feel good, right? Because, you know, isn't it human nature to want what you can't have? And the devil always tries to sell you on what you think you need. But when you get to what you think you need, you realize you didn't really need it to begin with. And so he sells you on to say, man, this will make you happy. Just, just get that up. Yeah, this will make you happy. Do this. This will make you feel good. And before you know it, little step after little step after little compromise, you're so far off center. And then the tempter that got you to be over here in, in, in the first place now takes the posture of an accuser and comes over on this side and says, see, I told you you weren't really saved. I told you you weren't really changed. I told you you didn't have it all figured out. You called yourself a Christian. You called yourself a Jesus follower. If you really love Jesus, you wouldn't be doing the things you are doing. And the person that got you into temptation will take on the posture of the accuser and then put on this coat of shame and guilt and condemnation, which is what we find in Genesis chapter 3. Because the, the devil slid, you know, kind of slid, slid, you know, slid, 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 comes in and says, did God really say you, you couldn't eat from the trees in the garden? She said, no, I just, he, he just said I couldn't eat from one of the trees in the middle of the garden. I got a picture, there's all types of trees in the garden with all types of luscious fruit. Why is it that, that, that the enemy would attack Eve in her mind? And why would Eve want what she knew she couldn't have when everything around her she could have? Because the devil always tempts you with the one thing that God said you can't have and God isn't wanting to give it to you because he doesn't want to be a good father. He's giving it to you to protect you. But the devil always comes in and tempts you with what you think you really need. Write this down. I have to make sure in my life that God's voice is louder than the enemy's. Because what you are full of is what you will be led by. And you've, some of you have been told that you're full of a lot of things. But I tell you, what you're full of is what you'll be led by. So if all you're allowing in your mind is fear, you're gonna make every decision based off of fear. If all you do is fulfill your mind with the vision and all this negative stuff, like if you put negativity in, I promise you, negativity will lead. If you put God's word in, God's will, word will come out. What you are full of, the problem with a lot of people today is we come to church and eat once a week and think we're gonna be healthy. Like if all you ever get to eat is the message I preached, you ain't eating. You're getting leftovers. This is what God gave me. Go home this week. Eat today. Eat a great Easter lunch and then don't eat till next Sunday and tell me how nice you are. You'll be like a rattlesnake in a corner with a weed eater trying to chop his head off. Meaner than a snake. Because it's not natural for you to starve your body. And the same thing with scripture, what we're, what we're full of is what we'll be led by. That's why Christian people can be mean and hateful sometimes. It's not because they're not saved. They're starving. They ain't eating. That's why we can have backbiting Christians. Why? Because they ain't reading. They're starving. That's why you can come to church and be miserable. Why? Not because you don't love Jesus. But you're spiritually starving. Your body's not healthy. Because what you are full of is what you'll be led by. You know, I, I don't know if there's any other, be, a, a better organization on the planet than the local church. Where other place can you go to and bring all your problems and not have to check them at the door? Like where is there, where is another organization on the face of this planet where we can have black and white, young and old, Pentecostal and Baptist all in the same room? Broken and put together, sinner and saint, all these types of people in the same room other than the local church. 
I don't know of another place I can go to where I can walk in full of shame but feel the love of God. I don't know what another place I can walk into that I'm radically loved. Let me tell you, there's not one other thing you can do today to make God love you more than he already does. There's not one thing. You cannot get the attention of God more than you already have the attention of God. His eye is on you today. He loves you unconditionally. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You can't do another single thing to make him love you any more than he already does. There's hope today. There's hope for you today. And the hope is found in Jesus Christ. See, no matter where you are today, it doesn't have to be the way it currently is. It doesn't matter where you're at in life, what kind of struggle, what kind of valley, what kind of issue. I've come to give you a message of hope today. You won't find this on the news. But I'll tell you this, that it doesn't always have to be the way it is currently in your life. Your marriage doesn't always have to be the way it currently is today. Your kids... They ain't always going to be the way they are today. That mindset, it ain't, it ain't always going to be that way. That struggle with addiction, it, you're going you're to grow up and beat that. It ain't always going to be that way. Amen. That battle in your mind of thought processes and negativity, and nah, it ain't always going it ain't, it ain't to be that way. Because see, the same question God asked Adam is the same question I'm asking you today. Where are you? And I'm not asking you to tell me where you are. I don't need to know where you are. But God does. And so for some of you, it's like, you know what, preacher? I'm here and this is what I'm facing. I'm here today. I've got some things I'm not proud of. I've got some issues I'm trying to work through. This is is where I am. Some of you, you're saying, preacher, this is the first Sunday I've been back since 2020. This is where I am. I'm a little fearful. Okay, that's fine. Where are you? Just identify where you are preacher, I've I've been in and out of recovery centers and I'm still wanting to go back. Okay, great. That's fine. Just tell God where you are. And what I know about telling God, why is it so important for, 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 for you to tell God where you are? Because he already knows where you are. And another way the enemy lies to you is he's saying, man, it's such a long journey back to Jesus. See, some of us are, man, you don't know, preacher, how, how, how jacked up my life is. I, I, this is the first time I've been in church in 20 years. I've got a big sin debt. My receipt's really long. Now, nah, listen, there's a really fancy word in the Bible called, said, uh, called repentance. Here's what repent, r- repentance means. It means simply to turn and do life differently. And what I know about turning and doing life differently is when you turn from your sin, boom, you're looking face to face at Jesus Christ. It's not a long way back. It's not a long way back. It's an about face turn around your life today back. He's not asking for your perfection. He's not asking for, your, for, for anything other than you to stop what you're doing, turn around and say, Jesus, here I am. I thought I had to run a long way. I thought I had to work my way back. No, that's what religion tells you, not my Jesus. He just says, here I am, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I, I will give you rest. Where are you? Where are you? Yeah, you can be seated. I got two closes today. Where are you? Identify today where you are. And it goes on. The next question that, that God, God asked Adam is this. Adam is clothed. If you look at Genesis 2.28, it says that Adam, Adam and Eve were both naked and unashamed. They were living in pure paradise. They did not see their nakedness. Genesis 3, chapter 11 when Eve took of the apple, sin entered the world. That's why bad things happen to good people, not because God's not a good God. It's because sin entered the world. Satan, when he fell from heaven and landed on earth, this is now Satan's dominion called planet earth. That's why bad things happen to good people. Adam and Eve, they partake, they both ate the apple. God comes looking, I want you to picture this today. In the still of the morning, the Bible talks about a breeze blowing. And God comes walking in the garden, looking for Adam. Why? The same reason he's here today, walking in this room. He desires a relationship with his people. And he finds Adam hiding. He said, Adam, what are you doing? He said, well, 
the woman did it, I ate it too, and I was naked and I was ashamed. God replies with this, Adam, who told you you were naked? Who told you, Adam? Who told you you were naked? You were walking around days earlier naked and unashamed, and now, now you realize and see your nakedness? Adam, who told you you were naked? Who told you you weren't going to come out of the thing you're walking through? Who told you? Who told you your marriage is always going to be the way that it is? Who told you? Who told you you couldn't break free from addiction? Who told you you sinned too much? Who told you you ran too far? Who told you God didn't love you? Who told you you weren't good enough to be a son? Who told you? Who told you there wasn't room in the church for you and your family? It's the same question. I'll tell you who told you that you had nakedness. It was the enemy. Packaged in shame. But the Bible says that we might be naked, but we can be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to tell you, who told you you were naked? The devil may have, but today I want to be clothed in righteousness. It don't always got to be the way that it's been. I might be on my way today, but I'm turning about face and I'm finding Jesus today. I've tried everything the world's had to offer, and no matter how far I run, how many people I sleep with, how many things I put in my body, I'm the same when it's all said and done. Who told you? You were naked. Who told you? Who told you that you had to work your way back to Jesus? I'll tell you, that's a bold-faced lie. Today, Jesus is here, and this is his posture. Just saying, turn around, son. Turn around, ma'am. Fall into my arms. And let's walk this thing called faith out together. Where are you? I'll tell you where you are. You're one turn around from a life that some of you never knew existed. Hey, you made it. So great that you watched the complete video. Obviously, the message spoke to you. Here's what you can do. A few things that would help me out, help our church out, and ultimately, I believe, help you out. Let us know what you're dealing with. Let us know what decision you made. Let us know how this message helped you. I mean, there's nothing like uh, receiving a message, but there's also nothing more freeing from your standpoint than sharing your testimony. The Bible says that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. Do me a favor, message us, get on our Facebook page, follow us on social media. And even if you live in our region, if you live in driving distance, we would love to have you come join us on the weekend. Check our Facebook out. Check our website out for service times. I would love to meet you in person. And until next week or until the next message that you watch on our channel, do me a favor, subscribe, hit that subscribe button. You, you'll, 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 stay in, you'll stay up to date with all the new content that we're releasing. We're constantly placing and putting new content out on our page. Do us a favor, get connected. Don't, don't wander through life alone. Ministry, community, faith. It's not meant to be done alone. It's meant to be done together. Thank you for joining us, and I can't wait to see you soon right here at the Warehouse Church. God bless you.